little turbulent for the diocese over the last couple of months. We'll talk to the bishop about that and more coming up tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome in. Nice to have you aboard. I hope you're all preparing and uh, getting ready, you know, fill up the gas tanks and get the generators going. Hopefully, not good. We're not going to have a lot of power outages, but it looks like it's going to be uh, tough tomorrow. In fact, just as a, as a note, we are actually uh, rescheduling some programming for Thursday and Friday as well, uh, simply because uh, getting guests to the studio might be a little blizzard challenge tomorrow. So uh, we'll have some uh, former programs that are really interesting. Uh, in, in, in the political and millennial world coming up on Thursday and Friday. In the meantime, I'm honored to have Bishop Thomas Tobin here. Here is a headline that I think is first important to note. Uh, the bishop celebrating 25 years of Episcopal ministry. That's a marker. Congratulations on that. Dan, thank you very much. How does and that feel? Happy, happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Um, it feels wonderful. 25 years is a, a nice milestone, and as I've reflected, it's an opportunity to uh, reflect upon the past and also to renew my own commitment for the future. I've often said a, an anniversary is a, an intersection between the past and the future and that's that's where I am. So many bishops when they celebrate 25 years of ordination are retired. I'm not quite there yet so I have a few more years to go. So you were you were like one of those young NFL coaches you, you know who get the <clears throat> the early break uh, in the pastoral career. I was 44 years old and I was named bishop, auxiliary bishop in Pittsburgh. I was there about three years and then in Youngstown as the diocesan bishop for nine years and now here for about 12 and a half years, exactly half of my 25 years here in Providence. All right, so I'd like to come back to, to some reflections on what 25 years uh, as a shepherd in the church has, has meant. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of things uh, come and go and change. You write about it often. Let's get this, uh, this conversation about the, the pension controversy um, resolved, at least for the church's perspective, the diocese's perspective. I, I'm not so sure that we've, we've heard enough from the bishop's side. Here's a headline uh, on this. Uh, receivables fate of uh, St. Joe's Hospital Pension Plan. And here's a, a story that uh, Eyewitness News ran in October that kind of sets the scene. Worked long careers at Our Lady of Fatima and the former St. Joseph's Hospitals. Now these retirees are demanding something be done about their orphaned pension fund that could run out of money in the next 10 to 15 years because no one is currently putting money into it. We never, ever, ever thought that this was going to happen. Never. Marilyn Horan is a retired nurse. She worked for St. Joseph's for 40 years. 3,000 of us who gave our lives for, for this hospital through blizzards and, and hurricanes and whatever, we gave our lives. Now unsure if her pension will be cut or how long she'll keep getting checks as the pension fund is now in receivership. I was so depressed about this when it first happened. I cried the entire weekend. And then on Monday morning, I said, you know what, Marilyn? Put those tears to action. She was on the picket line outside Superior Court and the Diocese of Providence Wednesday. The diocese started that pension plan, later selling the hospitals. Picketers holding signs with Bishop Thomas Tobin's face on them. Some signs reading, what would Jesus do? It was as plain as the nose on your face that they were losing money and they weren't funding the pension. Um, and that all of a sudden, we're in bankruptcy. And what are we all supposed to do? The diocese declining to speak on camera sent us this statement, saying in part, the Diocese of Providence has not been involved in the administration or management of the hospitals for over 50 years. The Diocese of Providence did not create this problem, and we are not able to resolve it. Why are people confused? Well, it's a very, very complex situation. It has a long history. But that answer seems like it's very simple. Well, yeah, we've been out of the business. We didn't have custodial responsibility of the pension plan. These other companies were running it. Right. I think from that perspective, it's, it's very clear. But keep in mind, this whole situation involves a number of years, involves three hospitals, involves three corporations, one of which has two classes of members, involves the nurses union, it involves administration of the hospital, it involves uh, state officials. So there are a lot of uh, parties involved in this situation. But basically the point you made is correct. The, the church, the Catholic church, has been out of the hospital business administration for seven or eight years now. 
And when we were involved in managing the hospitals, um, the pension fund was viable. What was the 50 year though? <clears throat> What's the 50 year? The 50 year mark is when St. Joseph Health Services Corporation was formed, 1965, I believe. It's, it's a little uh, uh, detail, I suppose, but yet very important. We talk about the diocese. There's no legal entity in civil law called the Diocese of Providence. The Diocese of Providence is comprised of something like 200 different corporations. That includes all of our parishes, uh, nursing homes, newspapers, cemeteries, high schools. So there are over 200 corporations that Bishop is involved in one way or another. So when we say the diocese has not been involved, that means it goes back to the time that St. Joseph Health okay. Services Corporation was formed and really became a separate, distinct entity from the diocese. So in modern times, though, seven or eight years ago, you discharged the, the operation and the ownership of the hospital. Exactly. Seven or eight years ago, St. Joseph Health Services, the Catholic Corporation, came together with Roger Williams Corporation to form Charter Care, a new secular corporation. Three or four years after that, that was purchased by Prospect, the health uh, agency from California, which is a multi-billion dollar for-profit hospital organization. So the diocese has not been involved in managing any aspect of the hospital for seven or, or eight years. Well, and when we were involved in it, the pension fund was functioning, it was viable, it was dispersing the benefits, it was paying its bills. It's the analogy I've used, Dan, is if I sell you a car, and seven or eight years later the car breaks down, it's sort of unfair for you to come back to me and say, what was wrong with that car? What did you do? Especially if the mechanics looked at the car and said it was in good operating condition. So eight years later it breaks down, it's, it's pretty hard to go back to say, what did you do? Uh, I don't, uh, unless there's a smoking gun, <laughs> I'm really, really confused as to the confusion. Right. Um, Ads like this have been, were running on the radio last month. Uh, here's an excerpt. Hey, did you donate to the Catholic Charity Appeal this year? Yeah. We always give to the charities and retired priest funds. Why? We did too, but I decided to stop giving this year when we heard what the Diocese of Providence is doing to retirees from Our Lady Fatima and St. Joseph's Hospitals. Oh, yeah, I heard. Those workers are looking at big cuts to a pension that wasn't worth a whole lot to begin with. What happened? Well, that's what the court appointed receiver is trying to figure out. But Bishop Tobin is fighting to block the release of documents that could shed light on what happened to a pension that was 90% funded just a couple of years ago. Why would the church fight to keep this a secret? Haven't they learned it's always the cover-up that gets you? I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty powerful. By the way, the, the, the picture is just the church because we're rolling radio. I don't know where it is. So there, that was not a TV ad. It was a radio ad. You know, ran during my radio show on WPRO, and I'm listening to this thing, and I'm, I'm you know, letting your outstanding communications people go, are you guys going to respond? And finally you did. Um, you weren't cooperative with the courts? Uh, some legal logistics in terms of uh, yeah. unloading some 7,000 documents that I think you yeah. did unload, correct? Yeah. I, again, let me say, first of all, to be very clear, we stand with the retirees and all those who have been affected by the pension fund. We understand their concern, their anxiety, their disappointment completely. And it's too bad this has become so adversarial. It didn't have to be this way. But from day one, the nurses' union really have... Uh, the unions come after the church and after me in particular, but the nurses union itself bears a very, very serious responsibility in this whole mess because they were part of the um, part of the decision. They publicly and fully supported the transactions that led to the demise of the pension fund. Well, do you remember what the funding level was when you when you uh, made the, tr the transition? Well, according to published reports, and this goes back a little bit more recently, as, as recent as three or four years ago, the fund was something like 90 or 92 percent funded, which is pretty well, good. Well, against public, it's, you know, against it's public employee healthy. standards, it's, out, it's actually A++++. Plus plus plus. It's, it's outstanding. So the, the when attorney we were general involved, Bush, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was functioning, it was viable. Hmm. We know what happened the last three years, but how it got to that point, um, I think that's a question everybody's asking. Well, the attorney general has a fiduciary responsibility here, and uh, he too is under a, a little bit of fire. I, I'm not sure... I think you've taken more heat. I think you're an easier target uh, than the attorney general is in this particular case. Do you have an opinion as to how he has reacted to this and whether he has been responsive enough to the court and to the case? Itself? No, not really. That's that's a legal question, I suppose, and a somewhat a political question, too. It's well above my pay grade or outside of my pay grade. I know the church acted very responsibly. We care about and concerned about the retirees. 
We hope this is resolved as soon as possible and as positively as possible. And um, I know that's that's where we are at the moment. Well, if you have no no legal management fiduciary uh, responsibility in this whole thing, do you feel a sense when you say you're with the union? Do you feel a moral sense of responsibility? And are you going to be reaching in kind of like any way to try to, to to try to make some kind of financial help here? I, I don't think we're in a position to make any financial contribution to this whole thing. Keep in mind, our moral responsibility, I think, was discharged when we supported these transactions, first the formation of charter care, and then secondly, the purchase by prospect. Uh, we supported those because Fatima Hospital was in, in serious difficulty. If we had not gone through that process, Fatima would be Memorial Hospital today. Fatima could have been closed. Which is a sad story. Exactly. Very sad. But because we did what we did, Fatima is alive, has employees, they're paying salaries, um, they're helping a lot of people in healthcare. So there has to be a positive side of the story too. Fatima Hospital is alive because of what we've done. And that's how we discharged our responsibility, legal, financial, moral, by keeping the prospect, um, prospect of health care alive so that people would have jobs. All right, last question on this. Why do you think, why do you think the rank and file nurses are holding you and the church responsible when the answer seems so clear? Well, I think you, you hinted at it. In some ways, um, the church is an easy target. The bishop is an easy target. If they want to pick at somebody, who else? Are they going to pick it? They're not going to pick at the nurses' union. That's their own organization. Or well, probably not helpful to pick at the attorney general or to go to the hospital and pick at their own employer. So, who else are they going to come after? They're the most visible and uh, uh, available person in, involved in this whole thing. Even though uh, we haven't really been involved for years. All right. Listen, church is still doing some good work in the midst of all this. We'll talk about that. And cardinal law, of course, passes and uh, a little bit of turbulence over his situation in life. We'll talk about that when we come back. So, uh, you know, the Cardinals passing caused, uh, you know, another kick up, understandably, of, of protests of the church. And some folks were, you know, pretty angry about the kind of pomp and circumstance that goes along with a funeral headline here uh, when he when he passed. Um, it is tradition for a cardinal to have, I don't want to use uh, slang or, or uh, improper terms, but all the liturgical bells and whistles are, are, are you know, in play. Mm -hmm. Should it have been pulled back for him? Well, and does it matter? I, I think it matters, and, and again, I'm not on the scene in Rome, so I think the Vatican followed its rather typical uh, protocols for the death of a cardinal, someone who's been residing in Rome. My impression was it was relatively modest. He died, he was buried rather quickly. Um, normal process and policies followed. So I didn't think there was a lot of uh, special attention, uh, honors given to him. I think they tried to keep it as simple, as quiet, and as, as quick as they could. That was my, my impression from the outside looking in. You know, he, he did so many good things and, and has a career um, a pastoral career that is just so blemished by the, the, the church sex abuse scandal. Uh, it, it reminds me of the secular stories of like the Joe Paternos of the world and, uh, and even the Bill Cosby's of the world where all of this career and all of this living and all of this story whew, gets wiped off at the end. Uh, reflections on him and then we'll talk about 20, a little bit more about the 25 years sure. that you've seen. I mean, this has been one of the worst things you've had to deal with as a leader in the church. It's been a terrible thing for the church. And, and you're right. We look at someone like Cardinal Law who served the church for many, many years in different places in many ways. He did a lot of great things. And his obituaries, I think, <coughs> excuse me, the fair obituaries highlighted that. Now, we should not dismiss for one moment the enormous harm that was caused by his negligence, his bad decisions, his, his failure to respond properly, caused a lot of harm to the church and to the, the victims of abuse, the survivors, their families. Um, they again have been victimized, I think, by his passing and by all the publicity that went along with it. At the same time, we need, 
we need to remember them, we need to support them, we need to pray for them and hope that they can come to some measure of um, reconciliation and peace and forgiveness in their lives. Until they reach that point, and it's a, it has to be a spiritual work, it has to be based on their own strong spiritual life. Until they reach a point where they can discover some kind of peace and reconciliation and forgiveness in their own hearts and souls, um, it's going to continue to be a nightmare for them. So we have to pray for that. It has to be a work, and a nightmare of, for the be church. work of God's grace for them. And a nightmare for the church because <clears throat> the church is not a place where they're looking for um, reconciliation. So the, the, the ironic paradox of the whole thing is that the healing probably will come outside the confines of at least the church structure, going to Mass on Sunday, communion, da da da. All of those things are most likely not in play in that healing process. For, for many of the victims or survivors, that's, that's true. I think there are a variety of responses that some of the victims have had. Some have been able to reconcile to the church and be involved in the church and find healing and peace and grace there. Some very understandably have gone beyond the church and have uh, fallen away from practice of any religion, any faith. And that, of course, that's, that's unfortunate. We can spend 20 shows uh, on this question, but what do you think, uh, other than this, or maybe inclusive of this, has been the biggest thing over 25 years for you? Well, of course, this was one thing. Now, again, I've been a bishop for 25 years. I've been a priest for 44 years. Um, I was ordained the same year that Roe v. Wade was approved by the uh, Supreme Court. So certainly the whole human life agenda has been part of my life uh, from the beginning of my priesthood. Um, concerns about marriage and, and family life certainly has become more uh, more of a concern in recent years. I think the greatest challenge we're facing right now is the number of people um, who are falling away from organized religion, Catholic and others. It's not just a Catholic problem. Certainly mainline Protestants and other religious communities as well. We are, we are becoming and have become a very, very secular culture and society. So that in terms of the Catholic Church, there's just lots of people who are dropping away from the church. The number I saw was something like, and this is an estimate I suppose, 80% of young people drop out of the church after they are confirmed. That's enormous, and that's going to have um, profound implications down the road. Why? <clears throat> um, gosh, I, I wish I had the answer to that. Some um, is this, the tone, the tenor of our culture and our society. Um, St. John Paul talked about the fact that we're living in an age that's characterized by practical atheism, existential atheism. So that people no longer bother to deny the existence of God. They simply try to live without Him. And that's true for those who are Catholics, Protestants, Jewish, Muslim, whatever. Um, people are moving away from faith, moving away from religion. And we see it in our culture, we see it in our society. But it's having profound effect on, on Catholic Church, on our schools, on participation in Sunday Mass, on vocations, on finances. Um, well, chicken and the egg it, in some ways, it's, right? It's a challenge. So the secular pressure and, and just this, uh, I get everything you're saying. Uh, has the church's tone exacerbated it? Um, I'm not sure because again, it's not just the Catholic Church. Hmm. It, it, you can find the mainline Protestant denominations of a very different tone than the Catholic Church in some cases. So, so they're having the same uh, dropout rate. Some ministers or theologians would say it's about relationship, not religion, with God. Well, religion is a kind of relationship. That's what religion means. Huh? Hmm. It's a relationship with God and with other people who share your faith and your vision and your values. So yeah, religion is all about relationship. Yet it seems to me, if I'm not mistaken, that that the young people that are coming into the church, including the priests that you're ordaining, seem to be a little bit more conservative. Uh, you're, you're considered a conservative uh, in, in the Catholic Church, uh, not necessarily some kind of uh, um, uh, equivalent of right-wing political wacko, but you are a conservative um, thinker. They're actually more priests of your generation that are liberal thinkers. Um, that may kind of feel really good about what the Pope is doing. Yet the younger, the younger priests coming in are almost cycling in a little. Am I correct in that analysis? <coughs> you've got, I, you've I got, you've got 90 seconds to analyze the whole thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's always the but challenge. But am I right about that? That's what I'm explain, thinking. Explain the Trinity in 10 seconds. Um, it, it is very complex. I, I think you're right. A lot of the younger priests who are coming in tend to be more 
traditional, more conservative, I think because they were influenced by Pope John Paul in their early days and then Pope Benedict. Now Pope Francis had brought a different tone in. But you, you can just see, I've been around long enough to see the pendulum swing back and forth. I mean, priests who came out of the Second Vatican Council now are the more liberal ones, if I can use that term. Now some are more, some of the new guys are more conservative. But, you know, that pendulum will swing back and forth. Um, I'm sure it's just part of the history of the church. Mm. Uh, it, it, it may feel monolithic to, to a lot of people who are looking from the outside, but there's a lot of discussion day in, day out, right? A lot of discussion, a lot of debate, and I think it's important that we not get too introspective in the church. We have work to do, and that's to preach the gospel and to take care of other people, so we shouldn't become too uh, introverted about this whole discussion. By the way, a couple of key services in this cold weather you should know about the diocese uh, provides. You'll hear about that when we come back real quick. Stay with us. It's just never enough time. I was joking with the bishop. The gay nativity scene was controversial, but we'll save that to next Christmas because there's always something going on. But uh, so is the cold weather. And the Keep the Heat On program is is really important. And uh, it's funny, Carolyn Cronin, the communications director for the diocese, just mentioned to me during the break that the very thing that the commercial that we talked about earlier in the show goes after, which is you know contributing to the causes of the church um, um, generates money for, for, for service in the community is really counterintuitive. Uh, if you say, hey, listen, I'm not giving the church anymore, well, guess what? Programs like keep the heat on right. and keep the cold on. Sure. And, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people might not want to give to the church. Uh, could be over the pension fund. That's the issue of, of the moment. Some people might not give to the church because they don't like our stance on uh, uh, homosexuality or an abortion or on the way we settle refugees or our acceptance of illegals. There are a lot of reasons. Ten more shows. Ten more, a lot of reasons people might be angry at the church and say, I'm not giving to that group, that organization. But, but the point is, if they don't give, then it's not affecting me personally. It's not affecting my job, my salary. It's not affecting those who are working at the diocese. In this extreme, it would affect our ability to help other people. So do they want us to stop uh, providing heating assistance for people who are cold? Do they want us to close a manual house and throw those poor guys out on the street? Do they want to reduce the tuition assistance we give or the money we give to uh, our nursing homes? Oh, it, it would affect the ministry, the charitable work of the church. And that is counterintuitive. It's counterproductive. So thank God we have lots and lots of Catholics who are very faithful, very involved in the church, very generous. We're blessed with that and they know the good work the church does. All right, uh, we shall follow up. Let's have many visits during uh, the year. What's uh, your 10 second wish for the 2018 calendar for everybody? Well, that it'll be peaceful and that everybody will uh, understand God's presence and importance in their lives because without that, uh, it's all very futile. Hey, Amen, it's good to Thanks. see you. Thanks, Dan. We'll have the final word when we come back. Stay with us. Yeah, we'd love to get the, uh, the nurses' union in here to talk about the approach in this controversy over the pensions. Nobody feels good about having all those wonderful employees for all those years having their pensions halved as modest as they were at 100% capacity. But it's very confusing to me as to why the bishop's story on this hasn't resonated with them. So we'll try to do that. We'll see you on the radio at 3. Bundle up and take some extra time. You're going to need it tomorrow. Bye.